Hello, this is Jeff Stuckey, uh, Product Manager for Super Resolution Systems at uh, Rupert FM, and I'd like to uh, welcome you to our webinar for the month on Correlative Super Resolution Confocal Imaging with the Vitara 352. Um, our agenda for the uh, agenda for the day is going to talk about uh, how the uh, the uh, benefits of the addition of the the uh, Optera scanner uh, to the Vitara 352. Uh, which is our uh, single molecule localization super resolution system. Uh, I'm going to review uh, the operation of the Vitara itself for a few minutes and tell you a little bit about the Optera scanner and then tell you how the two uh, components can be used together to do some pretty interesting work uh, doing correlative imaging uh, with confocal and super resolution microscopy. So the Vitara 352 uh, is a single molecule localization system uh, you know, doing calm, storm, those kind of techniques. Um, it's uh, one of the benefits of the uh, system that has precise 3D super resolution. Uh, we have 20 nanometer resolution in X, Y, and 50 nanometers in Z. Uh, and we do our 3D uh, with a uh, biplane technology, uh, proprietary technology to our system. Uh, we'll touch on that in a few minutes, so a quick review on how that works. Uh, the system's really fast, run up to 300,000 frames per second raw data. Uh, those uh, log images are obviously combined to create the uh, super resolution images, but that kind of frame rate allows us to be able to do uh, live cell work uh, with the Vitara 352. And then we now have the confocal option for correlative imaging, the uh, Rupert Aptera uh, swell field scanning system. So just a few points about the uh, uh, Vitara 352. Uh, this is a basic uh, schematic of the system. Um, you can see here we've got uh, uh, three, typically three, or an optional fourth imaging laser, 48, 561, and 639 are uh, standard, and then 750 uh, is a uh, optional uh, laser for the uh, imaging. Uh, we have a 405 activation laser. Um, the uh, typically use a 60x objective. Uh, and then the uh, it's a wide field system, so we're um, taking the uh, image uh, or the, the illumination from the lasers, uh, going through some optics in the system. We're basically imaging uh, a square multi mode fiber, <coughs> creating a 20 by 20 micron field of view here, our illumination area. And then the emission light comes out and goes uh, into the uh, biplane module, which is represented here, where we have a beam splitter. Uh, they're splitting the emission on the two paths, and you can see the one path is slightly longer than the other, uh, and image both of those <coughs> onto the face of the tip of the CMOS camera that we use as a detector. And the difference in these path lengths here effectively gives us two different focal planes. So we're actually imaging uh, two different focal planes. Uh, we calibrate the system on both of those focal planes so that we're actually able to image a volume that's about one micron and actually achieve 3D localization uh, of the particles that we're imaging uh, within that area. Some of the applications uh, that the uh, Vitara 352 has been applied to, uh, anything from infectious diseases, uh, cardiology, reproduction, uh, neuroscience, cell biology, cancer, and also developmental biology. So. Uh, really utilization of uh, single molecule techniques uh, with the Tara uh, allows you to address application requirements uh, within a wide variety of uh, different types of biological application areas. A little bit about the biplane approach. Load up the graphics here. And this is just showing a schematic. Uh, we'll walk through this so you understand better how it works. Up here on the left, uh, you can see uh, a uh, XZ projection of a sub-resolution bead being imaged where uh, we have a focal plane set here uh, where it's evenly spaced between the two uh, biplanes. And you can see that the intensity on both of the biplanes uh, represented here, the lower left-hand corner, looks pretty equivalent. And you can see over here on the right, uh, we're showing you some different uh, focal depths. In this case, you've got equivalent uh, intensity uh, on, uh, on both of the biplanes and zero nanometers, sort of this middle position here. If you move to a different position where the bead is actually up here, uh, where it's more in focus on the 
the top biplane here. You see there's a uh, lot of signal on the top biplane, very little signal on the bottom biplane. In fact, you can kind of see the airy disk here and see this representation here. So when we calibrate the system, we actually do a Z-series, remove the Z-motor, and we step through uh, a variety of various focal planes around the sub-relation bead like this, and we generate a series of images that are it's more granular than this. This is roughly what the appearance is. So that we actually end up generating um, two point spread functions, one for each biplane. You can see they're a little bit out of a little bit out of phase with each other. And the uh, calibration uh, algorithms uh, for the system take that into account, so that when we're imaging uh, specimens, uh, you'll see blinking where the blinking may be equally bright on both. Uh, biplanes, which indicate that the particle is someplace here in the middle of the biplane volume. Uh, if you were seeing blinking where it looked brighter on one biplane and not the other, uh, you know, one image of the biplane and not the other would indicate that it's higher up in the, the volume, and you know, the uh, reverse is true where blinking on the right one versus very little on the left would indicate that there's, uh, you know, closer to the bottom of the biplane. So uh, we can actually achieve. Uh, 50 nanometer resolution, and the total volume that we see uh, is on the order of about one micron. Um, the other thing that we do uh, with the system, we're using a CMOS camera. We like to use that because it's very fast. We can run it uh, at the uh, full frame rate of the CMOS camera is about 100 frames per second. We're actually running uh, with normal full frames for super resolution at about 800 frames per second top speed uh, because we don't have to use the entire chip to. Uh, project uh, all the biplane images that we're generating. Uh, one of the issues with a, uh, a CMOS camera here, though, is that they have pixel specific noise, which uh, can render that kind of chip difficult to use uh, for super resolution, some single molecule localization uh, imaging. However, uh, we're using a technique where, uh, based upon uh, uh, algorithms developed by Hang, Hang et al. in the uh, universe lab. Uh, where we can account for uh, this uh, pixel specific noise and uh, correct for it in each image. So we end up getting, rather than this, uh, an image where a background where there's this quite a bit of variability between the noise and the pixel, we actually get a nice flat, uh, uniform background image uh, that we can uh, operate off of. Uh, and this is happening uh, in real time during data acquisition, using, uh, with all of our image calculations, including the localizations. On a GPU, so you can actually see the localizations occurring in real time, and of course, this res enhanced correction occurring in real time also. Uh, just to give an example of uh, what we're talking about in terms of the 3D image uh, capabilities of the system, um, here's a uh, images acquired from an E. coli uh, specimen where the outer membrane was labeled with Psi 5. And you can see here that we've got about a one micron range of localizations that we've seen between the biplanes uh, on this particular preparation. Preparation in this case, these um, localizations are color coded uh, to show depth. So the red ones are toward the bottom of the specimen, and the blue ones are toward the top of the specimen. Um, another example of 3D imaging. This is a case where we actually did Z stacks. So we're acquiring that one micron volume uh, with each acquisition, but we can actually then also move the Z motor and acquire a series of those uh, to get even uh, a thicker uh, Z range acquisitions. And this that was a case where you uh, saw uh, this uh, mouse spermatocyte uh, and uh, in Z, and the full Z range on this was a little over eight microns. Uh, some other types of uh, applications. Uh, here's showing an example of live cell imaging. Uh, this is uh, HA uh, moving along uh, active enriched membrane regions and fibroblasts of so hemagglutinin. Uh, uh, in green, and then the actin in red. Um, Another example of uh, live cell imaging, this is showing again hemagglutinin uh, and actin uh, transferrin receptors uh, in a live cell experiment. And 
And uh, this is another example here. This is a human respiratory syncytial virus, uh, showing you some uh, X, Y, and XD projections. So you can see here how we can. Uh, we've got two different probes. Uh, you can see on the X, the X, Y projection uh, how they are uh, distinctly labeled, but you can also see that uh, on the X, Y, uh, or the X and the X, Z and Y, Z projections. So you can see that you can localize or visualize the uh, relationship between closely related probes in three dimensions. And an example of showing some nice, nice experiment uh, looking at canine cardiomyocytes is the one. 47 and the areas of interest here were these little sections uh, going between the, uh, the labeling on the uh, myocytes. Okay, so a few top few uh, points on the um, uh, Optera 2 design. Um, this is a scanner that we've used for a number of years for live cell imaging, uh, high speed live cell imaging. Uh, some of the benefits of it as a in general as a scanner is flexibility to match speed, resolution, and sensitivity to various application requirements. Uh, we can have high speeds and low toxicity of photo bleaching, uh, which enable time lapse volumetric live cell studies. Uh, software controlled thinnel size for optimizing resolution. And the uh, swap fill technology minimizes crosstalk, which improves axial resolution. And uh, just a a little bit about the uh, how the uh, beam formation is done here. We've got either pinholes, which are in a linear array, uh, different size pinholes here, and then various size slits on the excitation side, and then the same thing here on the emission side. And uh, this, but in pinhole mode, these linear arrays uh, is what gives us better optical sectioning than a uh, 2D array like a spinning disk. Uh, I mean, any kind of a multi-point scanning system is going to have crosstalk with the linear array, uh, where crosstalk is less than half of that of a 2D array, like it's spinning disk, and this gives better optical sectioning, uh, allows you to get image deeper into the specimen, that sort of thing. Um, just a review of the different size uh, apertures here, different size pinholes, and different size slits. And Quick overview of light path. So the excitation light comes into the system, goes through the aperture, uh, is uh, controlled, is scanned in two dimensions by either a galvanometer or a piezo, and the return light comes back through and is de scanned through an image set of emission pinholes and then paints the uh, uh, emission on the, on the chip of the camera and it forms the image. Uh, just a Physically, what that light path looks like inside the scanner, very compact device. So, the, some of the benefits of using the work for the Optera scanner. So, you can use the Optera scanner when it's attached to the TARA to do uh, basic cell biology experiments, you know, Z series time lapses, multi dimensional imaging. But what we wanted to talk about today was uh, using it in conjunction with super resolution to do correlative imaging. So some of the benefits and, and so how you use the Optera uh, in terms of workflow with super resolution. First of all, the scanner is very fast, so it's great for using it for sample navigation. Uh, when you have it and up, uh, you're going to do a, a super resolution experiment to find the, app, the the area of the specimen you want to look at, you just click a button to switch over to Optera mode, and then you have a live image of the Optera. And coming from the Aptera, and you can move the stage to navigate around the sample, look for areas of interest. You can move in Z, and it's very fast, uh, running anywhere from uh, up to up to 40 frames per second in pinhole mode. So it's a real time kind of image. Uh, so it's uh, just like navigating in the same way you would if you're just using a wide field camera. Uh, once you find an area of interest, you just click to store a reference image. Then you click another button on the interface to switch back to super resolution mode, and you're now using uh, the super resolution camera with the emission going through the, uh, the biplane. Run the acquisition for super resolution. At the end of the acquisition, uh, click on the review tab, which allows you to review the data you just collected. And uh, this is where the localizations will be put together to form a super resolution image. And then you can open up this, uh, after you've opened up the super resolution image, you can select the side port, which is the top focal overlay, and it will overlay those two images with each other. And the systems calibrated provide aligned images when you open the images. 
Uh, there's no you know user intervention required each time you do this. We calibrate the system. Uh, we uh, initially, uh, because of the field of views are not exactly uh, co-registered optically, um, so that we uh, use a very high precision stage to be able to determine uh, what the offset between those two are. So we move the stage slightly uh, to be able to go from console to the super resolution mode. And then post acquisition, we have a fine alignment uh, that we were able to uh, typically using sub resolution beads uh, post align the final adjustment required to have the images align, align with each other. So that when you then run experiments, and acquire the reference image and acquire the super resolution data and then open them up, they're already aligned with each other. So what are some of the benefits of using a confocal super resolution uh, for correlative image, uh, correlative imaging? Um, one thing, the confocal image provides sectioning so you get a much clearer uh, image than wide field for both sample navigation as well as reference. Um, I mean, if you're looking at something like tubulin and you're looking at sort of the edge of the cell, probably not going to be that much different. But if you wanted to look at tubulin in closer uh, to the nucleus, um, cells thicker, and if you look at that with a wide field camera, it becomes a little bit blurry. You can very clearly see uh, the tubulin uh, as an example with the confocal microscope um, and uh, during navigation, and then you acquire that as a reference image, you want to use it after uh, the fact uh, to do analysis or visualization. Uh, it's going to be a much clearer image than a uh, confocal image. The same thing will be true of uh, neurons. You'll see an example of that in a few minutes. So, single molecule localization, any of, you, any of you that have done single molecule localization experiments know that uh, the data may be difficult alone to, to visually interpret, especially when you're labeling proteins that are actually uh, forming clusters and are not contiguous. And that's very often the whole purpose of the super resolution experiment is you want to look at uh, proteins, uh, they're going to form clusters, um, and the clusters actually may co-localize. You may have two different probes where the clusters are co-localizing with each other, or the clusters localizing co you know, co-localizing with some other structures in the cell. And you may not look at a super resolution image. It may not be clear uh, whether you have actually labeled uh, the area or the structures that you were hoping to label or that you want to study. Uh, the confocal image overlay uh, provides clear verification of labeling location. And the confocal image can also be used as a reference for quantitative analysis. You'll see the example of that in uh, So, just show you some examples of what these, uh, uh, what the possibilities are here, uh, being able to use this uh, correlative imaging technique with confocal super resolution. Uh, the first couple are just to sort of give you an idea of. Uh, uh, kind of nice comparisons of the resolution difference between confocal and super resolution, and some ideas about how uh, you know the, the uh, kind of help helps you identify structures and the super resolution image by using a confocal image. So this is Alexa 647 tubulin and Alexa 568 lambda B. So lambda B is labeling the uh, nuclear membrane, which you uh, can clearly see here. Uh, in this case, this is. Uh, the, confocal, the super resolution data has been overlaid on the confocal data. And then, uh, sort of, this magenta color is the uh, tubulin. You can see the tubulin here. So, this is basically the area where I'm outlining here with my mouse that the uh, uh, super resolution field of view uh, is, is, is seen. It's about 20 microns by 20 microns. We've zoomed up on the right here. We've zoomed up a little bit so you can see more clearly. Uh, one thing you'll notice is interesting. You can see the uh, Tubulin uh, with the confocal here, and this is with the 60x objective. Um, and actually, we have a relay lens in with the confocal, so the confocal magnification is actually about 100x. But you can clearly see how much higher resolution there is here, uh, just the magenta, which you see from the super resolution images. Uh, you can also uh, then in green see the lamb and B, and while there are uh, that showed up out here in the cytoplasm, you can see that there's a much higher density here along the uh, nuclear membrane. And if we go to a, the next slide, it's the same preparation um, uh, manipulating uh, some of the display colors. So to make the, uh, uh, in this case, to make the tubulin in the super resolution image a little clearer, 
Um, the uh, color intensity was turned down a little bit on the uh, confocal side for the tubulin. And in this case, uh, because the real purpose of this experiment is really to uh, uh, demo slide, but it was uh, you know a primary interest of being able to look at the lamin uh, B uh, staining, we turned off the display of the tubulin uh, with the confocal image, and we're just simply looking at the confocal image in monochrome here, which represents the cell membrane, the uh, nuclear membrane, and you can very clearly see the uh, lamin B labeling uh, in the super resolution image along with the yeah. There. Um, another example, this is uh, Alexa, Alexa 647 peroxisomes. Uh, over here on the left, uh, this is an unzoomed image. You can see the labeling of the peroxisomes in purple and super resolution, and then in grayscale, uh, the peroxisomes uh, from the confocal image. And on the right, we've uh, zoomed up the image a little bit, and you can very see more clearly here. You very clearly see that the Peroxisome labeling is uh, in the super resolution is uh, the Alexa 647 labeling is primarily on the on the peroxisomes. Uh, there's actually a couple of areas out here where they don't look like they are, but if you adjust the brightness of the confocal image, they uh, are uh, clearly on the peroxisomes. And there's a few stray areas here where there's some little specks here and there where uh, that's basically background labeling where. Uh, it wasn't attached to the peroxisomes. So here's another example. This is uh, one where we've taken advantage of uh, correlative image to actually do some quantitative analysis. Uh, in this case, uh, this is 647 Homer and 561 bassoon labeling of neuronal cells and culture. So these are both uh, synaptic proteins. Uh, one's presynaptic, one's prosynaptic. And the idea here is we wanted to evaluate uh, what the what the <clears throat> colocalization of these two look like uh, within uh, synaptic areas. So on the left, uh, you can see at uh, standard magnification for the confocal, the neuron, and you very clearly see the uh, green and red labeling. And these bright areas here, these bright yellow areas, are actually areas where there are synapses. And then the con the super resolution uh, the area actually that the super resolution camera was going to see is within this white box. We don't have the super resolution labeling image overlay here yet. On the right, you can see the same image at the same magnification level with the super resolution image overlay. And you can start to see some of the specs here sort of in the background and uh, a little bit along the, the processes and where the synapses are. So here we've zoomed up the images a little bit. And again, on the right or on the left, this is confocal alone. So these bright areas that are yellow primarily are where there are um, uh, synapses. And then on the right, you can see the uh, super resolution uh, image overlaid on that. And you can more clearly see these red and green clusters here, very distinct versus sort of the yellow area on the confocal image uh, where they're localized adjacent to each other uh, when our confocal images are going to look yellow or on the super resolution images they're much distinctly red and green. Um, another example of this at a higher magnification level, here's the <coughs> confocal image and then we've got the super resolution overlaid on the confocal. So you can very clearly see here these very distinct green and red labeling areas look much less distinct uh, on the confocal image, uh, kind of blurring in with each other and uh, oftentimes just appearing in a sort of a, a yellow blob. Um, so while we can tell that there's a synapse here, um, you know, you can very clearly see there's a pre and post synaptic area here by these distinct labeling. So um, one of the things we did here is sort of demonstrate the principle of being able to use um, the confocal image as a guide for analysis uh, super resolution data was that we um, labeled synapses. Uh, we uh, used the confocal image to draw regions of interest around synapses, processes, and then the background uh, in this area here, sort of this triangular area here between the processes, and then did a colocalization uh, measurement. And you can see that uh, a couple of different, uh, this is using uh, the uh, 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 colocalization uh, analysis model that's in the uh, TAR software. Uh, a couple of different correlation coefficients. You can see that there's a high degree of correlation 
here um, in the uh, area labeled uh, in, in the area where the RLIs were going around the synapses. Uh, when you look at the processes, areas where uh, there's still very obviously there's um, uh, labeling, uh, but it's there's no synapses along here. You can see that the correlation coefficient drops down dramatically, and then uh, when you look at the area where there's the background here, where this is just sort of some not specific labeling, uh, the correlation coefficient is even lower. So just sort of from demonstration purposes shows the utility of being able to have a nice, uh, clear, crisp uh, uh, reference image, which can be generated by the Aptericot vocal to use in conjunction uh, with the super resolution data to get more precise uh, measurements of areas of interest for the uh, super resolution measurements. So in conclusion, um, focal resolution, uh, uh, focal super resolution correlative imaging definitely provides a valuable tool for contextual interpretation of super resolution data. Uh, you can very, very clearly see where uh, the super resolution labeling is uh, within the cell and various structures within the cell. Uh, confocal images and confocal super resolution imaging provide a guide for quantitative analysis of super resolution data. And uh, the integration of the Aptera scanner uh, with the Vitara 352 provides a unique tool in terms of being an ideal combination for ease of use and sample navigation and collection of topical reference images for correlation with super resolution images. So that's what we wanted to tell you about today. Uh, hope you enjoyed that. Uh, the, um, if you have any other uh, additional questions, you can uh, contact us through our website at blooper.com and uh, be happy to uh, uh, answer any questions and uh, tell you more about uh, what the Aptera uh, guitar combination can do for you as far as uh, some of the uh, 